Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. It is uh, not a positive week around here from a football perspective. Luke Jones joins us now. All of our WNST coverage brought to you by our friends at Raskin Global. And uh, Leonard Raskin would say the stock is down on the Ravens after the rain and Sunday night, Lamar Jackson. Luke, it was, um, you know, I don't want to say it's one of the, the, the – least fine hours in Ravens history, but it certainly was a disappointment. And I, you know, I got flippant before the game saying they were going to win 37 to three. I, I just, maybe not disrespect of Cam Newton or Bill Belichick or the weather itself. I, I guess I just had a little more confidence in the Ravens than maybe we need to have right now. As you always say, pump the brakes. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's fair. I, I, I mean, I'm surprised. Let's be very clear about that. But We've talked about this with 2020, the weirdness of this season. It's a Sunday night game. It's a New England Patriots team that hasn't looked like the Patriots, you know, even going beyond the obvious with Tom Brady swapping in Cam Newton for him and, and how Cam had looked after the first couple of weeks, really since testing positive for the virus. Uh, but a Sunday night game, an empty Gillette Stadium, elements certainly – uh, we're less than ideal, uh, but both teams are, are dealing with that. So uh, certainly not an excuse, but you know, it, it's one of those things where to be very clear, I picked the Ravens to win by two touchdowns. So it's not as though I had a, a major concern, but when you do look at what new England uh, was doing well, really the only thing they could really hang their hat on was they've run the football well this year. And when you're talking about not having Calais Campbell going into the game, I did have some concern there, even if it was relative. And then you lose Brandon Williams early in the game, and we know what the Ravens' run defense has looked like over the last four or five years when Brandon Williams isn't in the lineup. Uh, it, it didn't take long to be concerned. And, and then mistakes, uh, inopportune plays, you know, got some young guys playing that frankly shouldn't have been playing as much as they have been, but circumstances force that, and it, it just kind of snowballs. And – it's just one of those things where you see it's not going in the right direction and you're not really doing anything to stop it. And that's not a single entity. That's not an individual player or coach. Uh, it's really across the board. And before you know it, you're behind the eight ball and you're down two scores in the second half. And here we go. We're, we're talking about that narrative we've talked about over and over and over uh, going back to the playoff loss against Tennessee last year. So uh, it's definitely disappointing. This is not a Patriots team that I think is nearly as good as the Ravens, but for one night uh, with the way the Ravens played and some of the injuries that they had, and uh, you do give New England credit, and you do remember that is Bill Belichick over on the other side. Uh, it, it's something we probably shouldn't have been as shocked or should have at least been thinking about the possibility if the Ravens were going to go up there and not play their best football. And, and certainly they did not on Sunday night. That's uh, putting it mildly. The first thing, a lot of directions we can go in here, but let, let's start with the obvious and the Nick Boyle thing, right? So we'll go, we'll go through Lamar. We'll go through the offensive line. We'll go through Campbell and Williams. But let's talk about Nick Boyle and that injury and this offense and what this offense is going to be now moving forward. I mean, we'll – we can rip up Sunday night. We can talk about the rain and the football. And I, I saw that Matt Skur is now public enemy number one from the snap. And we can certainly discuss that. But moving forward for what this team is, we all have these visions of the, uh, you know, the, the violet uniforms last year at L.A. Memorial Coliseum. And I'm on the roof drinking free wine late at night that night. I found that picture from a year ago. This is a different football team. I mean, is it certainly a different offense, a different profile with no Ronnie Stanley, no Marshall Yonda, now no Nick Boyle. Uh, we talked about Hayden Hurst and the, the other tight end. Uh, we now are at the point where we're say, scratching our head and saying, who are these wide receivers again? Have we really upgraded here? Or is this a better unit? Is this the right psychological set of guys to have with a quarterback that you don't want throwing the football? So, there's going to be a lot of rip them up for a six and three football team right now because they're six and three on paper, but are they really six and three the next nine games as constructed right now the way they are? Yeah, and I think that's a very fair question at this point. And to answer your your question about Nick Boyle, I mean this is this is a major loss, and this is something that you're not going to hear ESPN or NFL Network 
or national talk radio talk about a whole lot because, and Mark Andrews even said this in his post-game comment, Nick Boyle's value to this offense isn't something you can easily quantify because you, you look at the numbers and you say, okay, well, you know, he catches a, a few balls here and there, nothing special. But we know, and going back a few years now, what kind of linchpin he has been for their running game. He's just so important with some of those uh, motion uh, type type things that he does. Uh, obviously a great blocker, uh, a guy that's regarded by some, maybe the best blocking tight end in the NFL. And just knowing he kind of bridges the gap in everything they do, right? I mean, they, from what they do running the ball and what, what they do in pass protection, if he's staying in, he can certainly go out and catch a few passes here and there. And it's just, I mean, clearly Lamar Jackson's the most valuable player on this football team. Uh, Ronnie Stanley, we've already talked about and we established probably the second best offensive player on this team they've lost. I'm not going to say Nick Boyle's the third best, but when you look at how valuable he is, when you look at how, how unique his skill set is, that is a really difficult thing to try to replace. And I, I know people will say, well, bring a tight end in. And I, I know they, you know, Luke Wilson, uh, former Seattle a tight end is someone that was on their workout list uh, that they're you know, planning to bring in and potentially, you know, now you would think probably a decent likelihood that they'll sign him. Uh, people will talk about some other names that could be out there here and there, but none of those guys do exactly what Nick Boyle does for you. And it is just such a big loss for a team that we know loves to run the football. Uh, they run it well. They're having issues on their offensive line. Well, the reason they run it well, though, is Ronnie Stanley, Marshall Yonda, Nick Boy, you know, Pat Ricard. That's the reason they run it well. And and Lamar's God-given skill set of fleet of foot, right? Like, But they run it well because the big guys up front allow Lamar a second to to, to get a hip, literally. Well, we we talked about this last year, how – how well this offense played, how in concert it was, right? I mean, everything just fits so well from run blocking, the offensive line, the trio of tight ends that gave them such a matchup advantage against teams that like to play nickel and dime. And they have these little corners trying to stick with Mark Andrews and Hayden Hurst. And, but, you know, throw Nick Boyle in there. Nick Boyle made some big catches last year. He's made some big catches this year up until uh, the unfortunate injury. Uh, but, Everything just fit together so well. And that's why you saw a quarterback that definitely has some deficiencies throwing the football, but that's why he had a 36 touchdown season. I'm I'm not saying that to take anything away from Lamar, but everything just fits so well. And you saw what the ceiling could be when all those pieces fit. You take Marshall Yonda away now. Obviously, it's a different year, and teams have, have, have focused much more on the Ravens' offense in the offseason, and that's not to say that they've necessarily solved it or, or completely figured it out, but certainly best practices are out there to a higher degree. And the other uh, part and, of it is the Ravens spent the whole offseason not trying to run the ball better. They thought they were pretty good at that. They were trying to throw the ball better, right? So the, yeah. the, the, the notion is they want to throw, and, you know, that – that hasn't gone nearly as well no. as second and two. <laughs> no, no question about it. And, uh, I mean, so then you, you take into account you lose your franchise left tackle that you <laughs> just gave a nine-figure contract to, and now you lose your best blocking tight end, who's essentially a sixth offensive lineman for you. You look at the issues they have. I mean, they, they thought so little about how DJ Fluker played in the first half. They, they put Patrick McCary at right tackle. Patrick McCary hadn't played tackle since college. And I, granted, he's in his second year, but he's someone they view as a center first and a guard second. And well, he's playing well, right Fluker tackle. Well, can't in the move, right? Half. I mean, you could see that in the rain. Like any linebacker is going to win a battle on him because they're just faster. They're just going to get around it, right? Literally. Well, and and this is what we said in the aftermath of Ronnie Stanley's injury. I said I think Orlando Brown Jr. can do. A, a, a solid, respectable job at left tackle. My big question was, what does right tackle look like then? Because not only have you downgraded going from Stanley to Zeus, but on the right side, you've really downgraded going from Brown uh, to DJ Fluker, who, let's face it, has been a guard for since his third year in the NFL. Uh, you know, he's been in because the league. Because he failed uh, a tackle. This is his eighth season. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so, you know, it, you get into a, a situation here where you're just talking about Guys reaching their ceiling of capability, right? I mean, we talk about this all the time with different players. Uh, you know, 
Marshall Yonda was a very capable right tackle, but he was an all-world Hall of Fame right guard. So, I mean, everyone has their limits that you reach. And, you know, and we can certainly talk about this on the other side of the ball when you, you subtract out Calais Campbell and then Brandon Williams and you look at the guys you're, you're depending on to play at that level. It's just not fair or, or realistic to expect them uh, to not have some drop-off there. And, and you saw that big-time drop-off. Uh, so, I mean, well, the drop off probably happens when you run the ball. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, our left tackle, he's the blind side and protecting the blind side of our quarterback who's going to throw the ball 35 to 45. That's not this offense that the right tackle is as important as the left tackle in this offense because of how balanced you want to be and how you want to run the ball right as well. And when you take Nick Boyle out to your point, who is a sixth offensive lineman, but he's a moving sixth offensive lineman. Right. right? And that is. I mean, they're devastated. I mean, they're literally devastated now from an offensive line perspective. And I think we've seen what Fluker, Macari, Skura, who's half sort of kind of injured and all of that looks like at this point. It is very, very ordinary versus the extraordinary look that we got last year. Uh, I mean, it's largely a mess. Uh, Well, let's call a spade a spade. It's... This is not something that's uh, even coming close to firing uh, at a high level. Now, we've seen flashes of it. They did run for 265 yards against Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago. Uh, They did have a really solid passing second half against Indianapolis, which, by the way, the Colts looked pretty darn good against Tennessee on Thursday night, so give them some credit. But we just haven't seen it, And, and we're not seeing it for 60 minutes. We're not seeing anything close to 60 minutes, and it doesn't feel like it's it's not moving in the right direction. I've, they're getting further away from where they were in 2019 rather than getting closer. Oh, and by uh, the way, Tennessee and it, Pittsburgh it, in the next 10 days, right? Literally, right? Well, well, there, yeah. I mean, and we'll get into that as far as the ramifications of not knowing what Brandon Williams' status is going to be. I mean, Calais Campbell, you know, is he going to be back? I mean, he didn't practice at all last week. John Harbaugh ruled him out on Friday. That's usually not a good sign for a guy's status for the following week, but we'll see. And certainly you and I will talk talk about it as we get deeper into the week and closer uh, to Sunday's game but uh, I mean it's it's just there's a lot to really point to right now and for me and and you kind of touched on this a little bit at the beginning of the conversation but I I couldn't help but feel uh, at the very end of that game where it's just a monsoon and and look no quarterback's gonna bring a team back (laughs) in that position needing 83 yards and 65 seconds when it's an absolute downpour like that uh, you know, you, you, it could have been Peyton Manning in his prime or Tom Brady in his prime, and I'm guessing they're not doing it in, in, in that amount of time. I think if Harbaugh would have known how bad the weather was going to be in the last minute, he wouldn't have punted the ball away. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, maybe so. I mean, Literally, I mean, like, if you would have looked at the forecast and saw how – that was going to look at that hour, you wouldn't have given the ball away when you had a chance. I mean, I, I'm just saying, I, not that the weather forecast is part of it, but to your point, you play that hoping to get the ball back one time. If you knew you were getting the ball back one time and it was going to be that god-awful, you probably wouldn't have given it up. That's yeah, right. and, and, but you could also say, well, your, your defense still gave up a seven-play drive then on, the, on New England's last real drive of the game, and you know they ended up taking 315 off the clock rather than, what, a minute? You know, something along those lines. So, I mean, there's plenty of blame to go around. But, you know, getting back to the point I was making, all of that, that downpour at the end, uh, I mean, just a deluge, I couldn't help but feel uh, it, w- it was almost fitting or, inappro- or, or appropriate in thinking that all of those ideas, uh, all those, that anticipation we've talked about all year, almost waiting for that light switch to turn on, right? Uh, that this team would start firing in the same way that it did last year, uh, that they would just hit their stride and they would look like that well-oiled machine. And look, to be very clear, this is not me writing this team off, but I think at this point it, it's appropriate to stop comparing this year to last year, to stop expecting that they're going to go on that kind of amazing, not saying they can't go on a championship run uh, because, Hey, look at where they are right now through nine games. Is it all that terribly different than how you felt about the 2000 Ravens who were <laughs> five straight games without a touchdown? You know, we've talked about 2012. So it's not to say they can't go on a run, but to just have this, anticipation this waiting around for it to start looking like it did last year and just waiting for them to just dominate teams and uh, and to win 12 games in a row and 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 do all of that 
you know, I, I think it's time to let that go and look at where they are realistically speaking now. I mean, let's face it. They're three games behind Pittsburgh. They're two games behind Kansas City, but really three because Kansas City has a, a head-to-head tiebreaker. This team, at, at the end of this week, they're the final wild card in the AFC. And they're facing a Tennessee team that, look, has had its issues. Uh, and, and I'm not going to sit here and hype up the Titans and say that they're, they're definitely going to come into Baltimore and beat the Ravens. But this is a team that's now a loss away from being on the outside looking in uh, when you're talking about approaching Thanksgiving. So they are much closer to being in that position than number one seed or talking about winning the AFC North or, or talking about being a Super Bowl favorite as they were last year. So you know, I, I think it's time to kind of let go the memory of last year uh, and understand that was a magical, special season. But, you know, as it stands in the regular season, you know, this is a team that I don't think it's in the cards for them to, you know, now just run the table and they're going to finish 13 and three. I think they can go 12 and four. Uh, I, I, if they go anything worse than 11 and five, I'd be shocked uh, because I do look at the next couple games. And then after that in December, there's only in my mind, really one game you look to the, the Monday night game in Cleveland, where I'd say, all right, I could, I could see them losing that game. Not saying they will, that, that they will, but that December schedule is still very favorable, but you look at these next two weeks, you look at where they are offensively, uh, already replacing Ronnie Stanley, already missing Marshall Yonda, and now you throw Nick Boyle in there, and you just look at this team. Uh, they got Mark Ingram back. That, that's, that's well and good, but uh, we've talked about the running game. Uh, as much as it's still been really good, it hasn't been special like it was last year. Uh, it hasn't had that overwhelming feeling of being able to impose your will on the defense on the opposition a week in and week out. We've seen flashes of it uh, again, but not the same week to week proposition that it was last year. And and you look at the passing game and look, I don't think Lamar Jackson played a bad game on Sunday night. Uh, Certainly you can look at the interception uh, at the end of the half, but considering the conditions and you see some of the drops over the course of the game, I thought Lamar was fine. You know, what was he all world MVP? Great. No, but I thought he played pretty well. The well weather for, conditions didn't lend themselves to it, that. Exactly. Right? But, but, but I, I look at, and I give credit to Willie Sneed, what he's done the last few weeks. He, he stepped up and done a nice job, but where is Marquise Brown? You know, for a guy who ran his mouth on Twitter after the Pittsburgh game, since the bye week, he has six catches for 54 yards. What has he really done since week one in terms of the hype for this guy being a first round pick and all the Instagram videos over the off season and talk about him putting on a little bit of muscle and, you know, the foot is now totally fine and, and the surgical screws out of it. I don't see him getting consistent separation. I don't see him get running particularly great routes. Uh, I think, you know, for, for all the clamoring of, of him wanting the ball more, at least in the post, the, the post game aftermath of, of the Pittsburgh loss. But he knows deep down he's not going to get the ball here. He knows that, right? Like, everybody knows that. Like, uh, you know, I, I think that's too convenient. If he, if he got the ball five or six I, I, times I, a game and, and had 80 he's yards the ball that of the play. He's getting the ball that often. Uh, I, mean, I think you're making an excuse just to, you know, I mean, I, I see a guy who's not playing very well. Uh, oh, don't, I don't, don't disagree with that. I, I'm just saying, I mean, he, psychologically, this is not a spot where he's he going to be a star, baby. You know what I mean? He's just not. I, I mean, okay. Uh, Mark Andrews was a pro bowler last year. So, you know, I, I, think, fair that's, enough, fair enough. I think that's a little too convenient, uh, but I'll say this. He's certainly not looking like a number one, <laughs> you know, he's not looking like what Derek Mason at least offered a Kyle bowler early in his career or not early in his career end of really the end of bowlers run in Baltimore. I should say uh, he's certainly not doing anything close to what Derek Mason offered Joe Flacco over his first couple seasons. And look, I'm not, I'm not trying to say Marquise Brown has to be Derek Mason, but ultimately the point I'm trying to make is, who's Lamar Jackson's go-to guy? When, when you really need someone to be open to make a catch and make a play, it's Mark Andrews a, a good bit of the time, although you know, this Sunday was the first time that Mark Andrews has cracked 50 receiving yards since week five. I think he know? gets a little bit of the Gronkowski treatment too. He's the I guy that a little you're more bit. worried about than anybody. Sure. And, and look, uh, Mark Andrews is a really good player, but you know, he had five touchdowns in the first five games this season. What have we seen since then? And 
Yep. And again, to your point, maybe he does get that extra attention. And I'm not saying Mark Andrews has been bad this year, but who are, who are the guys when you, when Lamar Jackson needs to convert on a given third down, who's he really counting on? And I don't, his legs. I don't think we really know that. And, I, you know, I, I don't think it's because Lamar Jackson can't pass. You know, I, I, I'm not going I'm, – I'm not going Dude, they were on third and 15 late in the rain, and their best play was a draw play and just have him run. I mean, I, I literally was feeling that the last few minutes of the game uh, on Sunday night where th- their best play on third and 15 is a run. It is. It really is. <laughs> eh, I, I mean – Lamar went 24 or 34 for 249 yards. Uh, you know, I mean, let's, let's not act like he's, you know, th- that this is Tommy Frazier running the option. Well, in maybe he was wet at the end of the uh, night, and that's the way I felt. I mean, when the weather deteriorated, I felt like third and 15 on a pass wasn't going to happen. Yeah, that's I mean, if you're, talking, if you're talking about the very end, I mean, at the very, very end, sure. But, I'm talking about the fourth I mean, quarter, but okay. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring up something that we talked about a lot in the second half of the Joe Flacco era. Does Lamar Jackson have enough help around him at this point? I mean, really? I, oh, they spent a lot of money on Ronnie something... Stanley, right? I mean, literally, right? And and they spent a lot of money okay, on but, Mark Ingram, but, and they spent a lot of money on Nick Boyle. For what have they game invested game. in their pass catchers, though? First round pick. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, how's that worked out for the history of the franchise? Not well. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, and look, this isn't me sit, sitting here saying they should have signed Antonio Brown, uh, because that that's not something. One, I think the organization was ultimately going to entertain beyond. Uh, a very, you know, simplistic level, uh, theoreticals, uh, but or hypotheticals. But I, I mean, it, it was obvious in the postseason game. You know, they lose to Tennessee. We talked about it over and over and over. This team has to figure out how to play off schedule. This team has to figure out how to play and function higher uh, from a passing game standpoint when they're behind. And what did they really do to, to in order to do that? They drafted a, a an inside linebacker in the first round and a running back in the second round. I mean, look, I'm, I like Patrick Queen, uh, although he certainly didn't play very well on Sunday night. Uh, I think J.K. Dobbins, yeah, is going to be the running back of the future. But, you know, from an analytical standpoint, people would tell you, you know, even drafting a running back in the second round isn't necessarily going to be great value if there you know, are, are guys at some other higher leverage positions available to you. But you know, I'm not trying to pick on those two specific uh, draft picks, but this team very clearly – had a had a deficiency and we talked about what and you even said it they want to pass the ball at a higher level what did they really do to to make that happen uh, i mean well, other they got than rid of saying, one of the guys in tight end who had some separation who actually oh, was there to catch the ball there you go but, he was, was a little bit like the more i think about like darren waller right and i know he had all sorts of issues and god bless him out in oakland or las vegas or wherever the hell they're playing this week um that sort of tight end who is a wide receiver kind of kind yeah. of more um that that is you know what we, Graham you know different guys that are built like that Gronkowski sort of that guy I don't know that Mark Andrews really is but hey nurse is a better offensive weapon than Hollywood Brown is right now <laughs> for this offense uh, I mean and, and and some of it's just it's a little perplexing from the standpoint of you saw how Marquise Brown played last year knowing that he wasn't 100 percent with a foot he, he was much lighter and I, not only is he not taking a step forward, but it, it feels like he's regressed. Uh, I mean, he had the big week one against Cleveland. Remember, they threw the ball well, and everyone's saying, oh, Lamar's better than he was last year even. And, you know, we haven't seen anything close to resembling that week one passing game since then. Uh, I mean, we've seen it in spurts. And that's not – again, I, I don't want to make this sound like Lamar has been terrible. He hasn't. And, and anyone who suggests otherwise is just being dumb because he hasn't been terrible. But he hasn't been as efficient as he was last year. And some of that, as I was one of the first people to point out, there was going to be some regression to the mean because of just how historically efficient their passing game was last year. But I I keep looking at it. Who are his real go-to guys uh, in crunch time? I mean, even Mark Andrews. I mean, he had another drop in the second half uh, on Sunday night. You know, we've seen him. He had three drops in the Kansas City game earlier this season. I mean, you know, even him who looks like the the biggest or the best example of a go-to guy that they have, you know, even we've seen him drop passes in, in, in big spots. So, I, I again, there's a lot of frustration uh, after a, 
a Sunday night loss to a team that you're better than, and the Ravens are better than the Patriots. I still believe they're better than the Patriots. You know, I give New England credit, but you know that you just look at that game and they're they're just there's a lot of frustration because every time you kind of want to buy into them hitting their stride, you know they they have a setback. You know, a couple of weeks ago against Pittsburgh, it was well they outgained the Steelers by so much and they ran for 265 yards and. Uh, you know, they're, they're on the right track. I mean, Lamar just can't turn the ball over. And that, you know, there was some validity to that. And we haven't seen games where Lamar turns the ball over four times very often at all. I mean, he takes care of the ball really well. But then last week, we see the offense completely sleepwalk through the first half. To their credit, they came alive in the second half. But you're, you're hoping that that second half is going to be a jump start for bigger and better things to come. And that didn't happen on Sunday night. And yeah. You can talk about the weather some. I'm not saying that's not a factor, but th- that New England defense has been garbage this year. Uh, they've been terrible against the run and the pass, and we didn't see the Ravens consistently be able to move the ball. They and playing been- without Gilmore, by the way, still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, defensive player of the year, for goodness sake. So, but yet, you know, we didn't see Marquise Brown getting separation on the outside. Uh, certainly a, a bad interception thrown by uh, Lamar Jackson in that spot, but you know, part of that is Marquise Brown's five foot nine. You know, that, that's the kind of play you, you, you want to throw up to a De, DeAndre Hopkins, like uh, Arizona was able to do in, in the final second. Uh, just a phenomenal play. How do we not deal for him? I, I, now I'm just well, being a fan here. I'm being Monday morning. Hey, <laughs> it, 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 it was reported that, you know, that they were, they were sniffing around there. Now, was Bill O'Brien going to trade Hopkins to someone else in the AFC? And, you know, especially at a, at, at the, <laughs> Yeah, the, the discount rate that he gave Arizona, probably not. But Boy, has anybody destroyed a franchise more than that, dude, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. I, I hear people waking up like killing Eric, killing John, killing oh, Ozzy, yes. you know, whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, they're 6-3 and three and half their team's hurt. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? If you were going to tell me they were going to play without Calais Campbell, without Brandon Williams, without Ronnie Stanley, without Nick Boyle, uh, without Tavon Young early in the year, uh, I'd no say Jimmy Smith, no, no Jimmy Smith, LJ Ford. Yeah, I mean, look, as much as I just expressed what is sure to be received as frustration, uh, especially looking at the, at the pass catcher department. And look, I have to be consistent here. I beat him up for years about not giving Joe Flacco enough help. Uh, if you wanted your, if you truly wanted your passing game to grow this year you got to do better than Devin DuVernay and James Prochet. And that's, look, DuVernay, uh, again, we see him with the ball in his hands. Uh, That's still something I think uh, can be fruitful for them uh, over the next couple years. So I'm not down on that pick. Uh, I am down on that being your your biggest biggest move, especially when you're talking about, as you mentioned, when when you traded Hayden Hurst uh, in in turn. So, uh, but to your point that you just made and it's, you know, look, the sky is not falling just because they're not 2019 level of regular season, great, historically special, a uh, best team and regular season team in franchise history does not mean they cannot win a Super Bowl Ultimately uh, again, as I mentioned through nine weeks in 2000, no one, you know, they, that team was probably viewed much less favorably than you'd look at this team uh, at, at this point in time. And, you know, we, we know what happened much later in the season in 2012. So, you know, it's not as though the Ravens had to go 14 and two again to, to avenge what happened last year. Uh, ultimately, just get in the dance and you see what happens. But, you know, when you look at uh, the body of work, when you look at the state of the offense, uh, assuming they'll get Calais Campbell back and Brandon Williams back uh, at some point in the next couple weeks. I- I'm still not overly concerned about the defense. I mean, the defense defense has been the biggest reason they, they are six and three right now. So I'm not concerned about the defense in the big picture, but the injuries piling up the way they do, they have knowing they're playing Tennessee and you know, Derek Henry is <laughs> almost the, the singular reason why they got Calais Campbell in the off season. Now, if you potentially don't have Brandon Williams either, uh, you know, if if those two guys are missing, boy, that's that's concerning. Even with the Titans not looking uh, so hot the last few weeks compared to how they looked uh, early in the season. But, you know, I, I look at this offense, and we, we talked about this after the Ronnie Stanley injury. I, I, I look at that group, and I do remember last year, I look at how this, pro, this offense profiles. You know, I, I don't have a high confidence level that they're going to put together a run of, of winning four games uh, you know, four straight games in January into February to, uh, to, to win a Super Bowl. But, 
you know, I, I, I didn't have that confidence going into 2012, uh, that postseason, uh, based on what we had seen in December where the Ravens lost four out of five to close out uh, the regular season. So you know, that's, that's, again, where we kind of go back to what I mentioned. It's time to put 2019 to bed. Uh, it's time to stop expecting, waiting, assuming that this team's just going to start clicking it to the dramatic degree that they did last year and understanding this is a different team with an identity that they're still trying to find with some injuries that they're going to have to work like hell to overcome. But as I mentioned, the next two weeks home against Tennessee at Pittsburgh, assuming you win at least one of those, you're still on track to have a really good shot to go 12 and four, which I picked them to go 12 and four before the season started. So even with some of these deficiencies and questions and injuries, they're still in a really strong position uh, as it relates to that. And I'll, and I'll also say this, there's one by, by, you know, there, there's one buy in the conference now, you know, so you know, the, the, the idea being the one or the two seed uh, that doesn't play nearly as much. Uh, am I going to sit here and say that I think they have much of a chance to be the number one seed? No, I don't. Uh, I just think they're, they're behind two ri- great or at least really good football teams. Uh, that's going to be tough to do that, given the fact that they have seven games to go. Uh, but the home field advantage going on the road in the, pl- in the playoffs, what's that even going to be? I mean, is it even going to be on the road or is it going to be a, a bubble somewhere? So some perspective, take a deep breath. It's frustrating. They're incredibly frustrated. The injuries are concerning, but I, I by no means it, acknowledging any of that is throwing in the towel on, on where they are because, as you pointed out, six and three is still a pretty good place to be. Rough week around here, uh, remembering the Titans and then looking at the Steelers and buying the turkey and wearing the mask and washing the hands. All of our WNST Baltimore positive coverage brought to you by our friends at Raskin Global. I'm wearing the shirt. Leonard Raskin will be here a little later on in the week, as will Todd Schuler from uh, damngoodlawyer.com and our friends at Blondell Miller Schuler. Uh, all of our sponsors make this happen. We have moved the entire platform from WNST.net over to BaltimorePositive.com. Lots of things, including two very, very interesting chats with our state senators, Ben Cardin and Chris Van Hollen, representing us in Washington, D.C. Mixing, matching, waiting for the Titans. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking Ravens residue and Baltimore positive.